Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 17th meeting in 2018 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I ask everyone present, present please to make sure that their mobile phones are on silent? We have received apologies today from the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross. The first item on the agenda is taking a decision on taking business in private. The committee has asked to consider taking item three in private. Uh, item three invites the committee to consider its future works program. Are all members agreed to take this uh, item in private? Yes. We are agreed. We therefore will move on to agenda item two, which relates to ferry services in Scotland. Uh, the, the, this is to take evidence from CalMAT Ferries Limited on the Clyde and Hebrides ferry services. I'd like to welcome from CalMAT Robbie Drummond, the Managing Director, and David McGibbon, the Chairman. Uh, I'd also like to make a special welcome to anyone watching this session on Facebook Live. Robbie, I believe that you want to make a short opening statement, so that the floor is yours, as it were. Okay, thank you, and uh, good morning. So I've met most of the committee, but for those of you that I haven't, uh, my name is Robbie Drummond, and I'm the Managing Director of Carmack Ferry Limited. I would like to use this opportunity to make some brief comments about the recent disruptions we have experienced. But before I do so, I thought it would be helpful for the committee if I clarify where certain ferry responsibilities lie, as it is clear from press comments that this is not widely understood. So Damon Bray and Malone with Scottish Ministers is a private company operated under the Companies Act with its own board of directors. And through our subsidiary, Carmack Ferries Limited, we deliver ferry services to the west coast of Scotland under the terms of a contract awarded and closely managed by Transport Scotland. The contract is managed on a commercial basis with significant financial penalties imposed on us should we fail to meet our contractual requirements, including technical reliability and punctuality. Transport Scotland sets the fares, specifies the vessel fleet we must use, and the particular routes and timetables that we must operate. Our vessels are leased from Caledonian Mar Maritime Assets Limited or CMAR for short. And while we're responsible for maintaining the fleet, and we decide how to deploy that fleet, decisions on vessel obsolescence, life extension, or investment in new vessels sits with CML and Transport Scotland. With regard to the recent period of disruption, I would like to sincerely apologize to all of our customers for the inconvenience that's been caused. We care deeply about our communities, and we do understand the economic impact on island residents and businesses, and we are very sorry for the recent disruption. In many respects, however, the current challenge we face is one of success. Traffic across our network has grown at 37% over the last five years, and while this has delivered real economic benefit for our communities, it has put our services under real stretch. Last year, we carried more than five million passengers, one and a half million cars, and just under 1 million metres of commercial traffic. Our 32 ferries made over 137,000 sailings to 51 ports. And during the summer period, we are running around 500 sailings per day. However, to deliver the summer tide that was set by Transport Scotland, all of our major vessels are fully deployed. This means that in event of disruption, we have no relief, of we have no relief vessels available to provide cover. And our priority in the event of such disruption is to ensure that every community receives a lifeline service, albeit one which may be less than the community might expect. And this has been the case with the recent disruption from the start of Easter, which has been, very, which has been probably the worst the company's experienced in eight years. The period has been very challenging for staff who have all worked incredibly hard, working directly with communities to deliver the best services that we can for customers. I would like to reassure the committee that a significant amount of planning goes into how we minimize the impact of any disruption. And such planning always involves locally based operation staff. And given the variability of our fleet, this is a complex task. We have, however, learned a number of lessons through the recent disruption. The first is that while the situation has been very fluid and challenging, Communications have not always been as quick and as accurate as we would have liked. So I'm absolutely committed to open and honest communications, and we are actively making changes to improve. 
The second lesson is our ticketing and reservation system, which as well as managing bookings, is the prime source of information going out to customers. Is life expired and needs to be replaced, and we're looking at how this can be achieved. The committee will be aware that I've made some reference recently to the challenges of maintaining an ageing fleet. As vessels age and systems become obsolete and therefore harder to repair, we all need to be aware that some impact on the service is likely, no matter how much effort goes into avoiding that situation. And just finally, we recognise the government has made considerable investment in both vessels and port infrastructure, and we look forward to receiving the vessels under construction at Port Glasgow. This will add much needed resilience into our fleet. So I'm now happy to take any questions from the committee. Thank you, Robbie. Before we move into questions, uh, just for you, your and David's uh, uh, help, maybe, if you want to come in and answer a specific question, if, if you ca catch my eye or try and bring you in. Uh, once you've caught my eye, if I could just say, don't then look away for the whole of the next 20 minutes while you give an answer, because then I'll be forced to cut you off. So if we could keep eye contact going, then we'll keep the questions moving, hopefully, freely. And the first question is from John. John Finney. OK, thank you. Um, and thanks for that statement, Mr. Rumman. Can you outline um, the cause of some of these recent problems, and can you see the efforts you undertook to find a possible replacement for the Klansman, please? Yeah, I mean, the, the cause of the Klansman, the Klansman has been um, now out of service uh, and in dry dock for a period of 65 days um, uh, while it had its tail shaft repaired, and that required um, parts and machinery going backwards and forwards to Denmark, so it was a significant um, repair that had to be undertaken. And there's now a further period of 10 days while that tail shaft gets further repaired. Regarding future vessels, and that's a challenge that we've been looking at in, in partnership with CMAL. Um, we've been looking at um, alternative vessels for a period of you know, the last two or three years under real depth. Our brokers are under instruction to search for vessels, and it's clear those vessels are just not available. And the reasons those vessels are not available is, first of all, the size of ferries that we have are quite unusual in the market. So ferries tend to be much larger or of a smaller size. So there is plenty of ferries available through, through Europe and in Greece and Turkey that may be available for lease. But those vessels are, don't fit particular Scottish waters. Um, they won't operate in the particular size of ports that we have. And they don't operate to the shallow depths that we have in, in Scotland. So our brokers and CMO brokers are under instruction for a constant search on vessels. And to date, there has been no vessels that have come up that have proved suitable. And it's maybe worth saying, we've been out with CMAL four weeks ago, looking at another vessel in Greece. So we are constantly looking at vessels, and brokers are constantly coming to us with options. Um, but those options, to date, have not been any, any that we can be taken up. Uh, uh, thank you. I, I've had, as I'm sure other members had, various representations made to us, and quite frankly, I could probably be here all morning putting them to you, but the, the convener wouldn't want that. But if I give you a flavour of maybe uh, three or four, uh, Mr. Drummond, please. And the, the first one is about the rack, lack of resilience and capacity in what's uh, an ageing fleet. Um, quote here, questionable decision making, um, and that is around the cancellation of the Malik Loch Boys deal on the first half of June, as is seen pitting one community against another. Now, I know you've, you've, you've you commented there, if I noted you correctly, you work directly with communities and you're keen to improve that. But again, another point made, quoting, is inadequate communications to communities during unplanned interruptions and inability to respond quickly to customers' representations. C can you comment on some of these, please? I mean, the, fir the first thing uh, I'll probably comment on, and I did cover it in my opening, opening statement, is in the summer, our major vessels are 100% deployed, so we have no spare capacity, which means that when we have disruptions of the size we've experienced, we are then into looking on prioritization. So how do we spread those services across our, our communities? And what we do is we try and ensure that every community has a service, albeit one that may be less than they would expect. Um, and we do that by looking at um, what is the best fit right across our network. We do it in consultation with communities, so we do have extensive communications with, with stakeholders. But clearly, given that the solution will be one that is less than the community will expect. It's going to be one that is, is unsatisfactory. So we do extensive communications with the stakeholders. Um, in periods of disruption, we work very hard to give our customers the right information through what may be 
a fluid and challenging situation. And can, can I ask about the Pira Tuig and the outage that will be there? Will there be engagement with the community around that? And because there are frustrations in any case regarding what's seen as insufficient capacity on the sky triangle, if we call it that. Yes. Um, so the, the, there's an option there that, that um, so we've had to defer the Malik um, Loch Boisdale service. Um, so there's options uh, elsewhere in the triangle to, to get backwards and forwards. So we're communicating with, with communities to make them clear what those, what those options are. Um, all of the passengers who are booked in those services have had their reservations moved to alternative sailings. So they've all been accommodated to, to date. You can't be happy with this situation. I mean, organisations, major organisations would ordinarily have some contingency to, to deal with what's routine maintenance or routine breakdowns. And I hear what you say about the challenge, but is this not something that would have been apparent at the time of uh, contracts? Um, or what have Transport Scotland to say about this? Remember, the, the, the contract, as I said in my statement, the contract specifies which vessels we must use and that we must take that fleet from CMAL. The contract specifies which routes and which timetables we must operate. So we are bound by that contract. And yet, clearly, it's, it's, an, it's not a an easy place for us to be at when we're looking at one vessel down and having to prioritise those services across different communities. And clearly that's a very uncomfortable situation, one we don't want to be in, and one we have sincerely apologised for that disruption. But the situation remains, we have no spare vessels to accommodate for this eventuality. And this has not been a situation of a, um, a minor, you know, minor breakdown. It's been a major vessel that's now been out for, you know, over two months and it's coming back in for another two weeks while we get back on track. So it's been a major disruption period, um, the worst the company's experienced for eight years. And we've managed our best to try and provide the best service we can through that period. Okay, finally, you are aware of the great frustration that there is in communities. I, I don't I'm aware of that and thank you. we're very sympathetic and we understand that. So. Okay, thank you. Stuart. Uh, thank you very much. I want to take uh, the argument a bit further because um, a, a particular friend of mine, who's not in my constituency, has uh, made the point to me that this is the ninth consecutive Easter where ILA has had service disruptions. Now, that suggests, and I'd be interested in your comments before I ask some other questions, um, that this problem is not simply one that's related to the failure of a single vessel at present, but is a systemic one that's affecting uh, some of our communities. But in particular, Isla, where I think the commercial interests in to the island tourism, I was the minister who introduced to RET, so I carry some of the blame, um, but uh, the whiskey exporting industry and livestock as well uh, are being affected. So I, I wonder if... Uh, uh, you, we could get some comments on the long-term problems that Isla and, I guess, other communities have experienced. Yeah, and I was at, um, so I was at the Isla Summit that uh, was held uh, a number of months ago, and we heard about some of the challenges there. Uh, and I talked about traffic growth across the network being 37%. Actually, traffic growth in Isla for the last five years is approaching 50%. Um, Isla's clearly now got the benefit of a two-vessel service, so it's enjoying that benefit. Um, but the ferries plan does say in the, that those, those islands have got a two-boat service. When there's an issue with the, with the fleet, then that, uh, that, that two-boat service may have to go down to one-boat service to maintain lifeline services across the, the wider network. So clearly the isla suffered um, uh, at the start of Easter due to the Klansman disruption. Uh, but again, we worked very hard to move all our bookings. Um, we were, and all customers were accommodated onto, onto new sailings. So very sympathetic with the, with the issues there. So I participated fully in the summit where we heard some of the challenges. And I think going forward, it's about how we provide more capacity, more resilience into, the, into that fleet. Well, let me, let me just go to that. Um, you made the point in contributions so far that you're contracted to only source your vessels via CMAP. First question, does the contract have a, a, a part of it that uh, provides for variation in the contract? Yes, it does. Right. 
have you asked for a variation of the contract to allow you to source vessels other than from CML? Transport Scotland have instructed both, of, both us and CML to go out and look for new vessels. And they've also indicated that if you can find those new vessels, then funding would be maybe made available, depending on budget constraints, to bring those new vessels into service. So, you know, that instruction is, is, is there to us and SEMA from Transport Scotland. Are there um, other harbours that would accommodate vessels that are not suitable for the main harbour on Isla? I'm sorry, I ask out of total ignorance on, on this subject, because I understand that there are at least a couple of uh, commercial operators who uh, have suggested they could provide a wet vessel service rather than the dry uh, vessel supply you get from CMOP. Um, as I say, we, we've been searching and CL have been searching the market for six years and no vessels have been found that would be accommodated in anywhere across the network, including, including Isla. And I think the challenge is that vessels have to be able to operate in particularly challenging Scottish waters and they have to be registered to do so, and that's different to the vest, the waters you'd operate perhaps in Greece or Turkey or, or other areas of Europe where there is spare capacity. And the other issue we've got is extremely shallow draft, and vessels aren't, just simply aren't made to operate with that level of shallow draft, and that's, that's the challenge. So if vessels were available, they would be brought up and, and presented to Transport Scotland as, a, as an option. Um, perhaps finally then, on uh, this particular subject, um, it strikes me as potentially unique that we have a, a transport provider who has absolutely not a single vessel uh, sitting in the yard to cover uh, difficulties. I can't imagine ScotRail operating a successful service without uh, having some spare to cover outages. I can't imagine airlines not having aircraft to fill in or contracts with other operators to fill in. Is that a unique position and is that a sustainable position in the long term for communities on the west of Scotland? I chose Isley but uh, we've heard of US Loch Boysdale etc uh, uh, and Malik uh, who, are, who are suffering as well. Um, so I think we've already seen that there is a challenge that our fleet is fully deployed and there is no spare vessels. If you talk to other operators and other, you know, I'm less familiar with rail but if you talk to other ferry operators, and I've talked to them constantly across Europe, um, they have, they operate their fleets and they operate them hard, but they have spare vessels available. So that they move vessels in and out in the event of, you know, wanting to provide additional volume in periods of peak, they will change vessels around, or in the event of disruptions, they'll bring vessels in and out. So it's, it's certainly a different situation than is faced in, by other ferry companies. David, to, to, to come in yeah, on that. So come in with, with Robbie. Uh, thanks, Chairman. I think it's fair to say that um, as far as the, the fleet's concerned, yes, oh, of course it would be great to have some spare capacity and sometimes in the past we've had that, but I would ask the co committee to remember, uh, and again this is out with our remit, um, that the two new vessels currently being built in uh, Port Glasgow uh, were due for delivery this year, which would have taken a lot of pressure off and given us some spare capacity as we've had before. And what you will remember, Mr Stevenson, when the, uh, when the uh, Loch Seaforth came into service, we did have uh, for a while um, the Isle of Lewis uh, a spare capacity um, until uh, the decision was made uh, to give Barra a dedicated service. And I was up in Barra only a couple of months ago and they see it as a sea change because they've got a great service, it's great for tourism and it's great for the island. So the quicker we get the new capacity, and again, that's out with our control, uh, the better we will be. Can you, can you just clarify? I'm not sure if I, I, I have that correctly. Did you say, Robbie, that you've been looking for a ferry for six years? Yes, and intensively for the last two, three years, as, as we have, as have um, CMAL on so, the instruction from Transport Scotland and none has So you've emerged. been looking for six years, uh, maybe it just indicates how difficult it is to find a ferry that, that meets the requirements. And, yes. and, and just sorry, the other question I had is, I think you said in your opening statement you'd been out to Greece, was it, to look at a ferry? Yes. What sort of price was, was that ferry being sold for? 
we've not yet got into that. Again, it's been led by CMA, so it's not yet got into that, that kind of level of discussion. Uh, but you'd be into I mean, I'm, as, I'm assuming if, if they're very few and far between, you've been looking for them for six years, that anything that meets the requirement will be, will be fairly premium price. The, you know, the expected price of a, a ferry will be into tens of millions. It depends whether you're going to buy it or whether you're going to secure it on a, on a bare boat lease mm -hmm. basis. Okay. Um, but it certainly will not be a cheap exercise. Thank you. Then so, you sorry, I, I think that's yeah. going to come up later. I just wanted to clarify before we yeah. came up to that session. Kate, I think you've got some questions. Great. Just um, two uh, supplementaries quickly to Stuart Stevenson's point about um, dry docking and the dry docking programme this year. There's been some questions around the dry docking programme for smaller ferries and that not being completed before the beginning of the summer timetable as it had been in previous years, particularly the Loch Brewster. Could you comment on that? Yes. Um, so we've got 33 vessels, 10 of which are major vessels, four medium vessels and the rest are minor vessels. So we run a very complex dry docking process through the winter period. So that lasts from the start of October right through to March. And you think that each ferry, major vessels are at least in for two weeks and smaller vessels are in for one to two weeks. That is a complex task. If you add up that number of vessels and you multiply that by one to two weeks, that's quite a complex process. Um, we did have challenges with the small vessel fleet um, and it wasn't to do with planning. Um, a number of the smaller vessels were re-engined. Um, so they got new engines put in as part of a, a program working with our, our partner Seamel and we had problems when those vessels came out post re-engining and that caused some of, the, some of the delays. I think with reference to the Brewster, um, that wasn't a re-engining issue. The issue with the Brewster was an obsolescence problem, which again illustrates some of the challenges we face, because there was a failure of a part on the Brewster to do with um, essentially a hook, um, which is a very simple part and not very expensive, but that part was obsolete. So rather than being able to go to the manufacturer and get one in you know, two to three days, they had to go and create that part, and that took two to three weeks. So a very small part that failed, because it was obsolete, meant that vessel was out for a much longer period than it would have done that was planned to provide a bit of extra cover on the on the Mallet route. So the dry docking program this year, was it similar to previous years or was it later this year than it previous was, years? It was very similar to previous years because each vessel has essentially got a date by which that dry docking must take place uh, and we can't go beyond that date. The challenge was the smaller vessels had, had issues when they came out um, and then the challenge was with the, um, the Klansman, that wasn't a dry docking issue, it was an issue that emerged in dry docking. And what that then meant was to avoid a bigger problem, because with the Klansman being out, we were one vessel down, we then delayed dry docking on some of the other vessels, particularly the Hebrides, because the alternative would have been to be two vessels down out of ten. And we decided that wasn't an attractive proposition, so we decided that we, having one vessel down for a slightly extended period, was a, was a better option for us. So that's why the high, whole dry docking process this year has been extended. It was a, a deliberate decision to try and uh, have better capacity while the commandsman was, was out. Do you think the proposals in the vessel replacement and deployment plan for fleet development and deployment will improve the resilience of the network uh, over the next few years? I think as, as, as David referred to, to recently, there's, there's two vessels on order. And what those two vessels do is that would potentially create a spare large vessel in the fleet, um, which would, there's then a choice as to what you do with that vessel. Do you, do you utilize it somewhere or do you keep it on a, a warm layup ready to step in should there be uh, a problem? It also allows us to flex the fleet and put more larger vessels onto different routes. It would certainly allow us to bring the Krusk, for example, back to the, um, to the, to the Malik service. So it offers, um, more resilience, certainly. So in terms of does that document do what it says it's going to do, it's more, more vessels provides more resilience for us uh, and that certainly will help. And as those vessels are newer, then they will certainly be more, more reliable. You mentioned uh, one time... Pushing one question into about four here, Kate. I'll let you have one more and then we're going to move one on to Colin. Question. And it's just about new vessels. You mentioned that there's obviously the two new vessels being currently constructed. How many new vessels have you had um, in, in recent years? 
I think we don't have it. Uh, the, um, I think when the minister was here, he said we had something like eight in the last 11 years, which I think from my own memory is about right. Um, we've had the three hybrids, we've had the Finlagen, we've had the Loch Seaforth, we had the Loch Shearer, and before that, the two were there, Gow and Butte. So there has been a regular investment over the last few years, uh, Kate, uh, but in essence, that's making up for a period before where... Uh, um, I remember when I first joined the board, my predecessor said um, to the minister, we need a new vessel every year for the next 20 years. And it hasn't happened, but we're where we are. Uh, and to be fair, the government is investing. And I believe the minister, when he was here, also uh, mentioned about a new vessel for, for Isla that you were talking about, which is, which is good news and is going to help. So the, the more we have in the fleet, the more resilience. But... In a sense, we are being, um, we're victims of success of the RET that Stuart Stevenson introduced. The RET has been a, a huge success across the network. And, and um, everywhere you go, you see the impact, particularly at the height of the summer. Now, it, yes, it gives us um, issues in the sense that we've, we're carrying a lot more people and a lot more cars, but that's great for the economy and great for tourism and great for the island. But it does give us pressures. But RET has been a success. Thank you. I'm now moving on to Colin. Thank you very much. And, and, and good morning to, to the panel. Can I, can I pursue um, issues around the, the replacement plan? I mean, it, it's clear from what we've heard today and what we've read that, that the current fleet, I think it's fair to say, isn't fit for purpose. It's a, it's a very aging fleet. The average age is, is 23 years. In fact, 15 out of your 31 vessels are actually over 23 years. So, that, so the current vehicle replacement development plan hasn't avoided the disruption that we've seen in recent months. Uh, and we've talked already about growing demand. So how confident are you that the existing plan will avoid a repeat of this disruption in the future? I mean, I think, well, first of all, that VRDP is a process that's led and managed by, by Transport Scotland. So we are, you know, we work closely with them as we do with uh, CMAL, but that's probably a question that you need to put to, to Transport Scotland. The fleet is, is fit for purpose now, it runs a service. Uh, the question we're looking at is, is sustainability and where that future investment needs to bring, be to bring more resilience into that. Into so what fleet. in your view needs to change in that plan to avoid this disruption in the future? I think that plan needs to look at the, um, which, which it does, it needs to look at the long-term future of the service. And I think what, what I'd like to see is um, us looking forward 20 years to see what is the investment plan over the next 20 years, both of vessels and ports. And when I talk to um, other ferry operators, that is the length of the time frame that they are examining their fleet. So they're looking 20 years, 30 years ahead and saying, what is the sort of fleet that we want to have in place in 30 years' time? What does that infrastructure need to to look like, and then plotting a path from where they are today to where they want to be over that longer term time frame. Because these are, you know, these are long term assets, uh, ferry lifespans are, are, are on average 25 years, but also the infrastructure that's, that, that we operate to that again uh, is, is, is important, uh, they are long term assets too. One of your, your main assets, of course, is, is, is your workforce as well. And can, can I ask a, a very brief question, Convener, on one of your ferries, the Isle of Lewis, which is um, 23 years old. You commissioned a, a private consultant to look at some of the health risks to seafarers um, from vibration on what is obviously a, a, an ageing vessel. Can I ask what steps um, you're taking uh, across the fleet to deal with these health and safety concerns, given the age of some of these vessels? Yeah, I mean, as, as a company, we take health and safety as our absolute number one priority. Uh, and that's health and safety, both of our, of our travelling uh, customers, but also of our staff. So we take that in, incredibly seriously. So we are looking, uh, again, with CML, at, um, uh, at where we can improve facilities on board for, for some of our staff and make sure that they are uh, got the right conditions that they would expect. But specifically around that issue that, that, was, that, that you, you commissioned a private consultant on, that the vibration within the Isla Lewis ferry, what specifically are you doing to address those, those concerns? Well, I think the, the, I don't want to go into details around that, but that is an issue that's, um, uh, that the, the, 
the vibration is at that level that is acceptable. So it is not causing a health and safety issue. Okay. Um, the next question then is uh, John Mason. Thank you, convener. Um, we've already had mention of RET, Road Equivalent Tariff, um, and I want to concentrate on the financial side of that, if I can. Um, so can you tell us some, something about how the finances work? I understand that, well, the fares are controlled, there's inflation increases. Uh, I think we've got a figure of 40 million has been provided by Transport Scotland to compensate for lower ticket income. Um, that's since 2008-9, so that must be about 4 million a year or something like that. But obviously you've got more vehicles, you've got more passengers, so they're paying more money. So can you kind of give us an overview of how the RET has impacted on the finances? Robbie. Yeah, um, so RET clearly has had a reduction in average ticket pricing, um, but has led to more volumes. But the net of that is, is lower revenue coming towards, towards Carmack. Uh, and that's something that was recognised when we bid for the contract. Uh, and when we bid for the contract, we took that fully into account because the RET changes were known about when we bid into this. So when we provided our bid, we, we, um, we estimated what our revenue would be, we clearly um, put a bid in around our costs, and that's what we took forward. It's important to recognise on revenue, the way the contract works is we are fully on the hook for, for revenue growth. So we are incentivised to grow, grow passengers and grow vehicles. And we work very hard with um, uh, local and national bodies, tourism bodies, to grow that traffic. Right, so can you tell us how much lower revenue you've got because, as a net effect? Because you've, if you've had 40 million extra from the government and it's built into the contract, is, is there still a net effect in there? Well, yeah, there will be. So the average revenue, revenue will be down, so there is an increase in subsidy. But it's, it's a hard number to detangle because it would require you to identify how much of that growth is due to low RET fares, so a pricing impact. But also remember there's significant growth in tourism anyway across Scotland, driven by um, security fears, driven by um, uh, lower value of the pound. So we already know there's more tourism coming to Scotland, so that's had an impact on revenue as well that the contract is, is benefiting from. So to answer your question, you need to be able to separate out what is the specific RET impact, and that's not something that we're able to do. And is there any link between that revenue that you're getting, be it more or less, and replacing vessels? Or are these two things so completely separate, there's no relationship? Um, f from our perspective, there's no relationship because you know, the way the contract works is we make a bid to Transport Scotland, we say we need this amount of subsidy to run the services for, for the period of the contract, and that's what Transport Scotland pay us, but that's completely separate to how they go and fund vessels, which is through CML. So it's a, a separate question. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, Mike, and then I'm going to bring in John, if I may. So, thanks, convener. When we were in Mull uh, as a committee, um, several islanders were talking to us about the difficulties of sometimes being stranded, not getting back to the island. And um, my question really is focused. We've got information here before us as a result of uh, road equivalent tariffs and the rise in number of passengers and then the rise in number of cars or vehicles. And it seems from the tables that struck me, if we, ju we just look at Oban to Craig New, Oban, Oban to Craig New, passengers up 14%, cars up 43%. Um, Oban to Lismore, passengers up 18%, cars up 55%. Um, Tuba Mori to Kilcoyne, 28% to 75%. So there's obviously a huge uplift in the number of vehicles going across to the islands. So my, my question is really, has there been an increase in the number of passengers unable to board services since this change in the fare structure? So the, um, the challenge we face is clearly through this summer period, and it's a certain peak sailings. Um, but that challenge is around the car deck. So there is no challenge on passengers travelling. Indeed, we are trying to encourage more passengers to travel because that's something that is, is environmentally sustainable but is also an area where we are not capacity constrained. We are capacity constrained on, on the car deck. Um, and that is, that is a challenge. So we, we, in certain periods in the summer, sailings are full and communities and indeed tourists will not be able to go on the sailings. That's not to say there is capacity during the week because there is, well, there is always capacity during the week, but they are at sailings that uh, may be less attractive to, to people. 
And you, you point on growth, an interest, interesting statistic is over the, having talked about 37% growth across the network in five years, over the bank holiday weekend of four days, um, our passenger growth was 17%. So we carried nearly 20,000 extra passengers over this bank holiday compared to the bank holiday last year. And we also carried 8% more cars than last year, which is uh, an extra 2,000. So just over those four, four days, you can see the level of growth that's been experienced across the network. Remember, that's not RAT, because RAT was in last year. So that's just growth. Would you be able, would you carry, do you have statistics? Would you know how many residents of the islands are un unable to catch, you know, get onto the ferries and have to stay over? I mean, would you, would you be aware of that? Um, is, is there any way that you can collect that sort of information? No, we're not aware. So there's no way of capturing if somebody goes online and is not able to book their favorite mm. sailing and either decides not to or, or books mm. an alternative sailing. So mm. that's not data, something that we, we capture. Yeah. Okay. Just before we leave that and go to John Finney and then Kate Forbes, one of the things that was also mentioned on that trip is that islanders have to make an emergency trip off the island uh, for, for reasons, you know, it could be personal reason, family death or, you know, bereavements or whatever. Struggle sometimes, they suggested, they might struggle to get off the island. Is there, is there capacity here to allow or keep back spaces for people in extremis to get off the island if the case is made? I mean, is there a few spaces kept back just in case the scenario comes up? So that, that, that's a really interesting question because our contract says that we must operate the services first come, first served. So the sailings just get booked up as passengers book it up. We did offer in our bid to, when we bid for the services, to create uh, a kind of reserve space and allow communities the ability to manage that space, whether it's you know, five cars or whatever it is. So we offered that up as, as part, of our, part of an option, that the communities could manage that, um, whether it's for, for, for funerals or access to medical services. Um, but that was not something that was, was taken forward, and we now require the contract to manage it on a first-come, first-served basis. So it's something that could be looked at, but would require a change in our contract. Thank you, that's very useful. Sorry, uh, John, if I've stolen in your question, I apologize. No, no, not at all. Thank you, convener. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Drummond, I would like to, we've been talking about the availability of ferries, but um, I, I want to try and understand the relationship between capacity and the impact that freight has on that. Because it's been suggested to me that um, the West Niles Council have been told in relation to the carriage of freight that um, there have been discussions and the discussions have mentioned are some, but the Scottish Government don't want to lease a vessel, which was previously used for the conveyance of freight on that length of lease. Can you comment on that, please? Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm not able to comment on any discussions you've been having. Um, there is uh, always an option to lease a freight vessel, um, and that has been done, done before for the um, Stone Way route. So that is an option that Transport Scotland could choose to, to look at. Again, should a vessel be available? So it requires a vessel to be available that could be utilised on that, on that route. And, and the relationship between the availability, and I understand that there is an offer, um, but the availability of a, a vessel simply to carry freight, that clearly has the potential to free up capacity for... Has there been any work done in the relationship between that and what the impact could be? Um, that could be published or made available to the committee? So there is a, there is a, a Western Isles stag ongoing, or just started. So that is a process that, that should emerge, and communities are gonna have the, op the opportunity to comment into that stag process, because that should identify what is the requirements, and therefore what's the best vessel configuration to meet those requirements. So that stag has been led by Transport Scotland and has started and I believe is due to complete in, in 12 months time or so. I was going to say, of course, the frustration people have is it's a torturously slow process. That's another, another year past. Mm. Do you have flexibility to, to deploy freight vessels uh, 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 to alleviate some of the pressure that there is by the carriage of heavy goods vehicles on your ordinary so ferries? I, I kind of refer back to a point. Um, we don't have any additional vessels. Um, so if there was a freight vessel made available and Transform Scotland wanted to fund it, then of course we could 
put that on place. We'd have to recruit the crew. The freight vessel would need to make sure that it could be accommodated at the, at the relevant ports. But it's something that, that could be put in place if there was funding available to, to do that. And could you uh, give an assurance that the trade unions would be involved in a process like that? Because you, as you did rightly identify, there are issues around crewing and staff terms and conditions. Yes, I'm absolutely sure that if, if that was brought forward, then we would do it in, in the right way and make sure that the right terms and conditions were being, being paid to staff. Because that's very important for us. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. I think you pushed that quite a long way, John. Um, and Kate, I'm not going to give you so much leeway on this question. Um, I'll start quickly then. Um, RE, the RET figures, uh, obviously there's some really impressive figures, up 33%. Does it concern you when there's either negative figures or really low figures? So if particularly, I can see Fishnish to Loch Aling is a minus figure on the RET carryings. And obviously, Malik to Armadale is 0.3% um, increase in passenger carryings. It, first question is, does that concern you? And secondly, how do these RET figures drive what capacity you provide? Because it could be chicken and the egg, more capacity, more demand, or less capacity and therefore less carrying. Um, I'm clear there's a relationship between um, capacity and demand. And what we find is that as soon as we put another vessel on a route, and if that provides more capacity, that leads to further growth. Um, which is, is really positive for our communities. So if we had more capacity, we would certainly want to deploy it because that would be great for communities and leads to you know, good sustainability. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I mean, I suppose, how, how do you mitigate some of the lower or negative increases in carryings? So I'm not, you know, I'm not sure what, what figures you're looking at, um, but clearly we want to make sure that... Um, all of our routes are growing, and that we've got customers using all of, the, all of those routes. So a mitigation is that we work very hard with local tourism bodies, uh, well, national ones and local ones. So our commercial department works with those bodies to try and drive more traffic through routes where there is spare capacity. So they'll work with promoting those communities as fantastic places for, for tourists and try and grow those routes. So that's something we want to continue doing because that's an area where we can continue to grow our revenue. So it's good for, for CalMac as a business, and it's good for generating returns with Scottish Government, but it's also good for <coughs> communities too. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, Peter. Thank you, convener. Um, I want to look a wee bit into the Scottish Ferries Plan, 2013-32, a 10-year plan. So we're, we're halfway through this plan. It was launched in December 2012. And uh, it it's focuses on where investments should be focused, improving reliability and journey times. Uh, it's about maximising the opportunities for employment, business, leisure and tourism. Um, what progress has Calmac Ferries made in implementing the requirements set out in the Scottish Ferries Plan? Probably my, my response is that the Ferries Plan is a Transport Scotland document that looks at how it wants to provide those services. We have a contract with Transport Scotland that says you must run these routes, you must run this timetable using these vessels. So as far as I'm, I'm concerned, actually a significant amounts of that plan have been delivered, but it's been, been delivered by being embedded into our, our contract that we're now delivering. And I guess your, your question is how do you, where do you look for the rest of it? And I think that falls to the VRDP, which looks at what's that future investment going to be around vessels and ports. Yes, yeah, so for in, in, in some extent, to some extent, you're saying the plan's always almost irrelevant because you know it, it's it's embedded in what you in what you do anyway. Would that be, would, is that a fair? Well, I wouldn't say it's irrelevant because clearly, you know, we were asked to deliver service. If Transport Scotland want to ask us to deliver more sailings or deliver them differently with different vessels, that delivers some more of that plan, then clearly that 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 option is open to them through mm. contract variation or whatever mechanism they want to employ. And we'd, 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 we'd work closely with them to deliver anything different that, that either they or the communities want delivered. But do you, think, do you think the plan is succeeding then and you know, meeting its aims of improving journey times, reliability, maximizing opportunities for business? I mean, that's what's embedded in the plan. Do you feel that, that five years in, you're, you're ticking some of these boxes now? You feel that, that there is there are improvements. Well, I'll pick up some of those things there. So you, know, you talked about um, opportunities for 
local businesses. So you know, we are carrying significantly more traffic. Mm. And that means there's opportunities there for businesses to get their product to market is in increasing. And we've seen some of that growth, whether that's the whiskey trade or shellfish markets, you know, that trade is, is increasing. That's opening up um, more opportunities for, for businesses. Yeah. You mentioned reliability. Um, in contract year one, our reliability and our punctuality was 99.5%, um, which if you compare that to rail is kind of mid-90s. We are delivering, um, delivering well in that proposition. Clearly the issues with the Klansman has, has knocked that back a bit and yeah. you know, we're, we're not happy with that situation. But if you, if you take out the Klansman situation, our reliability and punctuality of the service is, is very high. I said up at 99.5%. Well, I accept that. I mean, uh, we all, we've, we've investigated the problems already. Uh, mm. and ninety-nine and a half percent reliability and, and time on time would be a fantastically good figure. So I'd commend you for that. So with that, I'm finished. Sorry, can I just clarify something? You you, you said that uh, you uh, buy into the plan, but it's not your plan, and you can't influence the outcome. Is that what you said at the beginning, or have I completely got that wrong? It's it's Transport Scotland's plan. So it's Transport Scotland's plan. You can't, you can't influence it because of the contract, and therefore the, the plan doesn't really work. Is that what you're saying, or have I no, got that I, completely I wrong? I wouldn't, I wouldn't characterise quite in those terms. What I'm trying to say is that Transport Scotland's plan, clearly we can influence it because we work with Transport Scotland, and we work with CML, and we were, you know, the key role to play in what that plan looked like. But that plan went out and was based on consultations with communities in terms of what they, what they wanted. So Transport have now set that and <laughs> said to us, this is what you want us to deliver. So that's what we are now delivering. But in terms of what the future of that plan looks like, then clearly we'd work with Transport Scotland and CML in, in influencing um, and working where that future plan should, should go. Okay, thank you. Kate? Um, moving on to timetabling. Uh, what actions have you taken to increase opportunities for island residents to commute to the mainland? So, I mean, one of the improvements that we, we have brought forward in this, <coughs> in this contract is we have got a much more robust timetable consultation process. So the way the process works is that at the start of each summer and winter period, we um, start up a consultation pro program with communities. So um, communications is, is with communities that come back and say what, what concerns or changes would you like to timetables and we go through then a whole consultation process. We take the, the outcomes of all that consultation and we take it to, to Transport Scotland and have a discussion about whether they want to fund those additional sailings or changes to sailings that might be put forward by the community. So the types of things that we put forward are, are changes to link up with different um, different transport modes, uh, additional sailings, or indeed um, new routes. So those are discussions we would, we would take forward and where we're able to do them and um, then we'll put that forward to Transport Scotland. I think we have made quite a significant number of changes over the last two years that has improved connectivity, certainly. So connectivity, rail and buses is, is far improved. And one of the things we did in our bid was we appointed a transport integration manager whose key responsibility is to work with rail and bus companies in, in improving that, that connectivity. I think I would say, so there's been real changes made in that and making the timetable work better for communities. The options we have to extend the working day are more limited because we are then restricted by working time directives. So while we can move around sailings, extending them and creating more is, is more challenging because our fleet is pretty much at maximum capacity. But you do consider f um, sort of commuting peak times when devising timetables for islands that um, have a lot of residents that commute to the mainland. Yeah, we do. So, you know, our, our, our timetables are not, are, are delivered around what the communities want and designed with, with their consultation. So they're not even through the period, they will focus on the areas and times that are most important for, for commuters. And in terms of infrastructure, um, and presumably you'll, you'll be working with CMAL uh, and passenger groups to improve accessibility of ferries and onshore facilities. Yes. So, again, we, we don't own um, the ports or the vessels, but we do work closely with them to try and improve accessibility. 
Um, that's not easy with, with aging infrastructure. But we work very hard on the operational side for accessibility. So that's supporting customers who need uh, additional access or support or often the ability to um, park their car in an area that's more convenient to them. So on the operational side, we work very hard on improving accessibility. We're also working with, with CML on is the changes to physical infrastructure that could, could make a difference. You know, putting lift provision, um, access gangways, that sort of thing. So, all of, so are all your ferries accessible um, they are, to disabled passengers? Uh, they are, yes, they are all accessible, yeah. um, but not always in the most easy way because ferries are not ones that you can you know, put lifts in, for example. But we always create an operational uh, process by which disabled passengers can, can access the ferries. So, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Uh, Richard. Yes, Morning. Um, since I've been here, there's been a, a number of, since 2011, there's been a number of uh, look at and, and uh, meetings with Carl Mack and, and uh, um, basically looking at ferries. But can I refer to session three of this parliament? The Transport, Infrastructure and Climate Change Committee undertook a detailed inquiry into ferry services and then made nine recommendations to both you and the government, uh, basically uh, looking at speeding up the process, new innovative working practices to allow timetables to improve, um, contracts between ScotRail uh, and CFL should allow services to wait where possible for delayed trains, ferries without penalty, and the Scottish Government to facilitate discussions between ScotRail and CFL to identify capacity to improve. Um, are these nine uh, recommendations, have uh, most of them been implemented? And do you have a situation where the Clyde and Hebdes contracts allow Carl Mack ferries to hold services for late arriving trains or coach services without financial penalty? So I, I, I can answer that. I slightly covered that before, that we've had now a much more robust, we put in place a much more robust um, timetable consultation process. We have got a transport integration manager who works directly with um, train and bus companies on proper integration. Um, but just to clarify on, on penalties, we are subject to very significant penalties where we are late uh, or where we are not meeting timetables. But we are allowed under the contract to wait for a train. Uh, so we are allowed to delay the service and not be penalised under that. However, that is challenging because if we delay one service, that means, and say there's six in a day, then the next five sailings are all going to be late. And they may have passengers who are trying to make their own connections. So that's challenging. So you may, you, you may help some passengers, but actually then the rest of the day, you're creating a challenge. That means other passengers don't make their connections. So it's not, you know, while we are not penalised under the contract, it's, it's a, a difficult balance to try and manage. You can have a, a knock-on effect, and, and one, amongst, amongst one of the, the recommendations was to lengthen the sailing day. Um, do you do that, and when you talk about, so that I'll know for my own benefit, how much penalties did you pay last year? Um, so I'll, I'll cover those two, two points separately. So first of all, our, the majority of our ferries are operating close to the maximum working day and it's set by the amount of hours that the crew are allowed to work. So, again, that's an issue. If we delay a first sailing by half an hour, that may mean that later sailings we are not able to, to meet, which would be really challenging. So those options, extending the day and adding sailings, are not, are not available to us without bringing on additional crew. And bringing on additional crew means a complete step change in costs. So even to put one sailing on, you're looking at a whole crew, and that's really challenging. Right. Um, my last question is, do you now work with ScotRail? Well, you, you say you do, but um, do you really work with ScotRail and bus operators to develop timetables that allow easy transfer between public transport modes? And I can understand that um, sometimes ScotRail is late, sometimes a bus is late, traffic, etc., and that makes you late. But how do you, uh, unlike uh, ScotRail, you, don't, you can skip stop, um, but basically you can... Uh, how long would you hold back uh, a ferry for a, a late train or a late bus? So skip stopping on ferries. Uh, Robbie, no, do you want to answer that? You can't <laughs> step, skip stop on a ferry. I understand that. You can go a wee bit faster if you want to go. So we've got, the time. 
we, we've got um, operating protocols in place with, with rail and buses so that there's contact points so we know when late arriving trains may be arriving or late arriving buses and the answer will be different depending on which ferry it is. So clearly with short routes we'll take a different response to, to longer routes and it's a balance of managing it right across the whole day. I, no, sorry, just to phone on benefit, committee benefit, do the ScotRail contact you to say the train from uh, wherever is late, going to Oban or whatever? Yes, um, they would do. So there's, there's operating protocols in place that we would be, regular be aware of that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Colin, you want to come in on that? One way to, to, to obviously improve connectivity between rail and, and, and the ferry companies, of course, would be to have the same company running both, although the government have enabled um, legislation to have a public sector bid for the current ScotRail franchise, which runs to 2025, but could be broken in 2020. Can I ask, uh, and one suggestion has been made that it could be CalMAC, that it could be that um, public sector bid. So can I ask if you've had any discussions um, over preparing a public sector bid for the uh, ScotRail franchise? Thanks for that. Yes, I, I too saw the, uh, the comments and the one of the tabloids called Caledonian McTrain, I think it was called. Um, clearly, yes, we are uh, in the public sector. We're owned by Scottish ministers. Uh, we want to expand the group in terms of uh, ports and harbours and ferry services, both nationally and internationally. Um, we've noted the comments on rail. Um, as far as rail concerned, we, we don't have any experience in rail, um, but... Uh, in terms of developing the group, uh, we would be interested in exploring the possibilities, and the board's discussed that, but only that. We would need to know an awful lot more about it and what it entailed and what the costs would be, uh, and so on and so forth. But we would be interesting, without any commitment, um, as a public sector body, to look at it. But, but obviously the clock's ticking on that. Has there been any uh, involvement from the Scottish Government with the, with the company? You want to know? Um, I think, as, as David said, that we have um, indicated our interest in having a discussion with Transport Scotland about the possibility of us operating a rail service. But the key thing for us is, what is the shape of that rail service? So if there's going to be a contract, what is the nature of that contract? What is the relationship going to be with rail track? What is the relationship going to be around transfer of risk? So there's a whole load of questions to be answered about the shape of that before we get into any kind of more deeper discussions? We've not had detailed conversations, but we've indicated to Transport Scotland that we're willing to talk. Okay, uh, Jamie, I think you've got a question. <clears throat> Thank you, convener, and good morning, uh, panel. Um, if, if my ears are not deceiving me, we've just spent the last hour talking about lack of resilience on our ferry services in Scotland, but you just said you're interested in running our rail network. Uh, is, am I correct? Well, we, we are uh, a company owned by the Scottish uh, Government. We are in the public sector. Um, we are in transport, um, and, and we know a bit about transport. So um, we would be interested in at least exploring um, uh, with the, the, uh, the appropriate um, Transport Scotland people in real what, what it would entail. That's, that's all we're saying at the moment. Okay. Back to ferries. Um, it sounds to me that like it's a bit of a perfect storm at the moment. We've got an ageing fleet of v v uh, vessels. We have a, uh, a network which is at capacity with absolutely no resilience in it at all in terms of spare vessels. Um, yet there's an operator which has absolutely no ability to alter some of the decisions that are key to improving the situation. So you're saying to me that these are all decisions for Transport Scotland. Uh, you're not in charge of routes, timetabling, fares. You're told which type of vessels to use. You're not in charge of the investment decisions, the plan, the strategy. So are you happy with the status quo? Because it, it, to me, it sounds like something is amiss in the system here. I mean, I think what, what you described there is the nature of a franchise contract. You know, we, we are running a contract to run a ferry service. And clearly, we work very closely with, the, with our communities of what that service needs to look like. And we have committed to a whole range of improvements through our bid that will make that a better experience. Um, we're also committed to working with, with CMAL and Transport Scotland around how to improve that resilience into the future and working on what that strategy long-term plan might look like. So 
you know, we are committed to working with them in partnership. We are committed to working and improving the service as we progress through the contract. But it is, it is a contract. Are we, are we happy with the situation? It's a contract. We, we knew what the situation was when we bit into it, and we are, we are um, doing the best we can with the assets that we have available. And our staff work incredibly hard to provide a robust service. But, I mean, none of this happened overnight. How did we get to where we are in a situation where there's no capacity? All it takes is one large vessel to go offline or a delay in the delivery of new vessels, as we have at the moment, and suddenly uh, we're seeing the knock-on effect of that right across Scotland. I mean, people are watching this online. Islanders must be angry and furious about this. Today, the Parliament is discussing the Islands Bill, uh, yet here we are uh, asking questions about what's gone wrong and how do we fix it, and all I'm hearing is it's all outside of our control. Um, I think what we're saying is that there's a combination of growth um, and there is vessels there that we are, uh, are doing the best we can to deliver the best service that we are we're able to. I'm not sure what so else I can say so, to so that. So it's not your fault that it's Transport Scotland's? No, I, I'm not, we're not saying that because we do take um, responsibility for our, our delivery. But clearly, we don't own the strategy for the longer-term fleet. That sits with Transport Scotland. I think we all need to acknowledge that RET has been a fantastic success for the communities. We also need to acknowledge that there has been significant growth in tourism traffic that has also bring real benefit. And I think the conversation that, that we need to have with, with Transport Scotland and CML and our stakeholders is what does that long-term strategy around vessels and ports need to look like for the next 20 to 30 years to deliver the service that, that we all want. And finally on the uh, issue of um, tenders, whose decision is it to put forward a bid for a ferry service? Is it CalMac or is it David McBrain or is it Transport Scotland? So it, it's to, the question of who puts forward a bid, it is David McBrain which is a, a private company with its own board of directors. So David McBrain as a business wants to grow and look at other, um, other business, whether it's in ferries or other logistic operations. And you'd be aware we want a large contract down in Marchwood to operate the Marchwood military port. But that is a purely decision for the board of Dave McBrain as to which um, opportunities it wants to pursue uh, and which opportunities that best fit the purpose of the business. So on the basis that the uh, communities of um, Orkney and Shetland have uh, quite publicly re rejected the concept of CalMac running the ferry service up there. Is it your intention to put forward a bid to do that? So, what, as I said, that we, we are a business that wants to grow. And our, my understanding is that I wouldn't characterise it in that, those terms. I think what they said was they didn't want to allocate it to a single operator. They wanted to have a competition so that the best operator would emerge from that competition. And having won a number of bids, we are very confident about going up against private operators. We believe that we can deliver a better service for customers and one that is more cost effective. So we are not afraid at all about going out in competition on, on any terms. Thank you. Uh, Richard, followed by... Yeah, just uh, a, hold so, on, sorry. Richard, followed by Stuart. So. Yeah, just a quick question. Uh, David McBrain made a, a, the, the holding company stated some time ago, assuming that vessels have a lifespan of 30 years, vessels need to be replaced at a rate of approaching one per year. You have uh, these several vessels that are being uh, coming to you in the next uh, uh, while that have been built at Port Glasgow. Uh, what, what is there for the future? Is there a proposal to have one built every year or what has the government said to you? I think that comes back to the strategy for identifying that is the VRDP, Vessel Deployment Plan, is owned by Transport Scotland. So we already know that there is two new vessels being built at Port Glasgow. There is a question of, or, or, or option of, um, another ferry being built for the Isla service. And then the question that VRDP needs to address is then what is that future strategy around vessel delivery? Um, I think I've you know, been on record with saying that the average age of our fleet is 22 years. We've got eight vessels that are over 30 years, and um, there clearly needs to be a, a review, a long-term future, about how that resilience is, is maintained. You need one a, one a year, which would help you and also help uh, uh, the workers at Port Glasgow to build. So we, we've made no statement about needing one per year. I think your comment is simply a question of maths. If you want to maintain 
30 vessels at the same age, then you need a, a frequent development program. Um, so we've, not, we've had no demands. You know, we will operate the service with the assets that we have available and make the best job we can. But you would like one a year. <laughs> I Sorry, think, thanks. I, I, I think you probably uh, pushed that too long. Tr tried to put words in somebody's mouth. Could you just get, just confirm to me before I come to Stuart? Is uh, do, do you actually do Calmac ferries actually feed into the uh, government's review on ferry procurement? Do they actually say, look, this is what we need, this is when we need it, and how are you going to produce that, or or, or is it the other way around? Do they tell you what they're going to give? So just to be clear, do you mean procurement, or are you talking about the replacement? Strategy. Well, the, if, it, if it's the replacement the, strategy, then, then there the is a... Procurement of, of ferries, new yes. ferries and replacements, okay. yeah. So, uh, in terms of what that looks like, then we are part of our uh, kind of tripartite discussion with Transport Scotland and CML and ourselves and looking at what that strategy might be and what the specification of any future ferries might, might want to look like. So, you know, if we're looking at the Isla vessel, for example, then you know, we will be clear about what our requirements are for that vessel. Uh, put that forward to Transport Scotland and CML to deliver that. Okay. Stuart. Um, just a simple question. We heard about 11 new vessels that have been in recent years. Has that reduced or increased the average age of the fleet? Um, if you look at a chart of the age of our fleet over time, it is um, going up the way. So clearly it's had a positive impact. Of course it has. Um, but our average age is... Is 23, and that's just a question of a question of facts. Is there a difference between the large vessels and the small vessels? Not a not a material difference. Okay. Can I just ask for clarity uh, before I ask a final question? Is unless anyone else on the committee has a question, is is that uh, the two ferries that are going to be uh, that are being constructed are, are they going to be when are they going to be delivered, and is that when you expected them to be delivered? The, so, I think, as, as David had already said, they were expected to be delivered um, this summer. The latest indication we have is they'll be delivered sometime in winter 1819. So, as soon as they are delivered, then we'll be able to put them into, into operation. Sorry, I, I always get confused, and the committee will, 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 I'm sure, understand my confusion. Is that winter of 18 or winter of 19? Just clarify, it's is that the winter this year or the winter next year? Winter next year. So sorry, it's the, our winter timetable, which is 18-19. Um, so it's next, next winter. So September, sorry, November is winter, isn't it? So that's November 19. 18. So when t between 18 and 19. So I always get confused, and I like to just be understand because we usually get into a discussion about seasons, and then Our that confuses me. winter period runs me. from October 18 through to March 19. Okay. And, and the final question is, is, well, there's two questions. First of all, is when these two ferries come in, will you still be looking for an additional ferry? I think, as, as we've said, that the VRDP has identified the need for an additional ferry on Isla. So that's, that's the next one we'd be looking to, to put in place. What I've already said is that those two ferries come, coming in, it gives us really improved resilience because it does enable to do a cascade through the fleet. It potentially frees up one major vessel, either to be used as a spare vessel or to be deployed somewhere else. So it does give us real improvements on our resilience. Yeah, I mean, I mean, my question is, is simple. That I'm sure most businesses, that if they said they'd been looking for a bit of machinery for six years, doesn't matter what it is, and they couldn't find it, um, to say that they're continuing to look for a bit of machinery, having had no luck for six years, might realise that, that they're looking for something that, that they will have to buy rather than, or commission rather than buy uh, second hand. And, that and that's the, the, the position I want to find out. Um, you're saying that you're going to keep looking for something that isn't there, or you're going to... We will, so we've already said, and we've committed to Transport Scotland, that we will commit, along with CML, to continue looking for vessels. But as none has emerged in six years that are suitable, there isn't a high expectation that any will emerge over the next six years. But we'll continue with that process, because there may, may be one emerging, in which case that may offer a shortcut to providing some additional resilience. But you know, the most likely and obvious way to bring resilience in is to 
build more vessels into the future. You should have commissioned it four years ago, maybe. But anyway, we'll leave it at that. I think that uh, that's been a very useful session for, for the committee, Robbie and David. Thank you very much for come, coming along. I'm now going to suspend the meeting for five minutes to allow a changeover of witnesses. Is that right? Yeah. No, we're going to move into private sessions. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I, I have got that wrong, as the clerk's pointed out to me. I'm now going to suspend the meeting to allow the witnesses to change, and then we are going to move into private session. So uh, the meeting is now therefore closed or fair. Thank you.